a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people of his own, so that you may announce the praise of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So who were they, these countercultural persecuted community, to whom such extravagant words were addressed? They had never seen him. That they identified as disciples of Jesus Christ. And the word of faith came through others who themselves were not eyewitnesses. But through Christ, they had received a profound, hope filled understanding of the meaning of life, the sacredness of every person, the presence of God, and the ups and downs and in the ordinariness of life. The example of goodness and love and joy and forgiveness that Jesus splashed across the landscape attracted this community of people. They were an inclusive group. Jewish Christians, Gentile converts, poor and not so poor, but all were welcome. Amongst them deeply committed men and women in an age of persecution, wondering what lay before them, and undoubtedly some clinging to by their fingertips to the faith that once seemed so clear and certain. So it is always been. But all were sent on a mission. The mission to announce the good news of Jesus Christ by being servants of one another and to the world of which they were a part. I have a reproduction of Monet's painting, The Haystacks. The artist images a series of four haystacks at different times and seasons. And one following the brilliant light of the sun makes gold of the haystack. And the others, a light gradually recedes so that one is hidden in darkness. So the community of faith. At times so vibrant, so alive with light, reflecting the way of Christ. And sometimes, the image is obscured, not clearly, boldly, humbly, faithfully reflecting the light. Yet always in the community of faith, there are holy people whose light will burst forth, burst forth in due time. So the way of the church through the ages, light and darkness, saints and sinners, God is so patient with us. Into this church I was ordained in 1951. The church in Chicago at this post-war time was confident, observant, and compliant. Churches were packed, schools filled, seminaries bursting with young men seeking ordination, convents expanding to welcome young women. There is no denying how externally vibrant was the Catholic Church. That the sense of identity, the mission was clouded, its focus on clear, an exaggerated dependence upon authority, upon external observance. Priorities were not in order. There was institution, which always calls for uniformity, not movement, which is always focusing on the coming of the reign of God. It's elusive. We cannot put our finger on it very often. We have to seek it. An institution marked the church, a status quo, not a creative, searching, probing, exploring, welcoming diversity and unity. Our one evidence of this was the institutional racism that was shared with every other American institution, all the other churches as well. Something was wrong. For example, white boys and girls were denied entrance into some of our Catholic high schools. A few priests vehemently protested to the Cardinal, but it was only in 1958 that the great Cardinal Albert Meyer, with wisdom and courage, ordered parishes and schools and hospitals to admit all. Now, when the World Council of Churches, seeking the Unity of Christ Free First Church, when they met on the campus of Northwestern University, we were pointedly ordered not to have contact with them. No humanism at this time. The Catholic Church seemed to be a fortress, reigning the faithful in at the very same 
same time protecting us from the forces of the outside world. But other voices had been emerging for some time, pointing to the interiority of faith, to freedom, to involvement. My spiritual director when I was a deacon was Father Blix Dandel. Now you have to understand that all the priests on the faculty were given nicknames according to their idiosyncrasies. <laughs> and later on, I would have my share of them. But Father Blix Stanley was an old man, very highly respected in the Jesuit order, and a real prominence. And I went to him, and I learned so much from him. Mostly his manner, gentle, warm, accepting, challenging. And he said to me one time, many times, George, you must develop a deep personal love for Jesus Christ. And then there was Father Dan Cantwell. Father Dan Cantwell, by his example and by his teaching, connecting a commitment to the poor and the marginalized to this love for Christ. The piety of faith in action and action in faith. They go together. And you cannot separate them. My life experience told me that there were so many men and women not aware of the subtleties of and ramblings of theologians, not even necessarily in the church, but so many people who from whatever source sprang into life with goodness and kindness and honesty and unselfishness and commitment. They too were being led by the Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit so did the greatest hope of the last century, Pope John the 23rd, Tell us the impetus that led to proclaiming the Second Vatican Council. The Holy Spirit led us. 2,300 bishops gathered in the fall months of 1962 to 1965, and they prayed, and they dialogued, and they argued, sometimes bitterly, as they reflected on the meaning of the church, its worship, and its relationship to the attributions of the modern world. Now the church was to be understood not primarily as an institution, but as a people of God. The people, all of us, challenged to be transformed into holiness in the way of Jesus. That's the way, not in any other way, not what we think, but the way of Jesus. And to turn to the outside world, always tempted as are we, by its love for wealth and power, and prestige to turn to what the coming of the reign of God meant in all the moments of life leading to life after life. The church from the time of the Second Vatican Council was no, long, no longer a triumphant perfect institution, no. It was a pilgrim of people threading its way in time and led by the Spirit and so changing society like water dripping on box, seemingly impervious to the hope given by Christ, but continuing on trusting in the power of God, God is promised and God will affect it. This vision of hope in God, in the community of faith as I experienced it in my immediate family and in my extended family, teachers, fellow priests, and people I met of all kinds. I experienced all this, and I brought it to the table in Harvard Cody in 1972, appointed me to be priest in charge of St. Hubert's West. There's no such thing as priest in charge. <laughs> but that doesn't stop hard enough from me. <laughs> but really, I was pastor, servant leader to those wonderful people of Schomburg and Hoffman States. St. Hubert's West, now Church of the Holy Spirit. Named by his critics as the church of what's happening now. <laughs> yeah, that's what they call us. I was proud of it. <laughs> I thought that was great. But we ministered faithful to the light of Vatican II. I'm so amused when people talk about me, being faithful to the magisterium. There's no magisterium more significant, more important than that which came from Vatican II. No statement of a pope, no statement of a bishop. No, Vatican II is a point of reference for the holiness that we are required to live. Those first parishioners, they were 
young. And they were educated. And they were questioning men and women. What does it mean to be a disciple of the Lord? And so we had a continuing thrust for deeper understanding. Programs like Search for God and Adult Understanding of Faith and Renew and the Study of the Gospels and Vatican II and the History of the Church. All of this we offer to people so that they can be adults in their faith, not children in the faith, but knowing somehow how they are to look at the world and the call to holiness and the call to involvement. When we invited youngsters to the altar servers, we took it for granted that girls in this world, boys were welcome. And women were welcomed in all the ministries of the church from day one. And the second leader of our parish council was a woman. We found a way through privacy of conscience to address the pain of marrying divorce and remarried efforts. And from the beginning, we formed structures, those various ministries that we had in the parish council. Always changing, always evolving, but the voice of the people were heard and responded to. Our worship space, this place, so simple, uncluttered, and clear, embracing all, evidencing the primary place of the holy, the people, not brick and mortar, the people are the temple of the living God. So I served as pastor of the Church of the Holy Spirit for 24 years, and my life is like everyone else's life. Light and shadows, joys and sorrows. But I have had the privilege of ministering in many different settings. African American parishes, chaplain in the United States Air Force, spiritual director and deacon of the seminary deacon program at St. Mary of Lake Seminary. But my ministry here at Holy Family Church is the greatest joy of my life. Through these years, the staff and dedicated leaders with me did our best to minister in a collegial, self-giving, life-giving way. And I think that all of us who have ministered here can give thanks for one another, for the people to whom we have ministered, and for the opportunity offered us. So here we are, the church of 2016, quite different from the church to which I was ordained in 1951. Not as measurably successful as that, but with a far deeper sense of identity, of mission. Led by the Holy Spirit, we know that we are a people calling down by the power of the Holy Spirit, the reign of God. And that every issue, every person, every event of life is to be sort of connected to this Jesus and his way so that the reign of God will deepen in our world. We continue the theme, All Are Welcome, by warmly embracing the Hispanic and Asian people who join us. But we at the Church of the Holy Spirit are part of a larger worldwide community of faith. And that worldwide community of faith has been humbled and chastened by many issues and factors. But we continue with great hope. Because our hope is not in anything that is strictly and only human. Our hope is in the Lord, who promised His Holy Spirit to come to us to abide with us. And we are greeted up by that beautiful passage from the Epistle of Peter. You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people of His own, so that you may announce the praise of God, who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light.